So I'll say a couple of uh, introductory words first and, uh, and I'll pass over, over to EJ afterwards. Um, so first of all, thank you very much. It's great to see so many of you late law scholars uh, have joined us for this session. Um, this is the, uh, the third talk of the Laidlaw Global Talks series. Um, and this one is titled Developing Leadership in Action, um, Developing Countries and it's the story of the Bangladesh Youth Leadership Center. Um, and as you've already seen, we've got EJ Amat, who's very kindly agreed to join us. Um, these uh, summer leadership talks, um, St. Andrew's students might, uh, might have heard or might be familiar with them already um, because we've done them for several years, but they give you an opportunity um, to learn from people who are out in the field and, and, and doing leadership, um, kind of the things that we're trying to encourage you laid law scholars to, to do. So we're really delighted that EJ has found some time. Um, my name is Alex Stanley. Uh, I run the laid law scholarship program uh, in St Andrews. And before I hand you off to EJ to, to hear his fantastic story um, and to have a Q&A session afterwards, um, I just thought I'd share with you a little bit about the, the kind of the background and the story of, of how I first met uh, EJ. Um, and for this, I need to take you back well, two and a half years uh, to a very cold, wintry morning uh, in St Andrews, uh, February 2018. Um, the university was actually closed as well at that time. Um, and uh, we ended up having to almost break into, into one of the closed buildings. I don't know if you remember that, EJ. Uh, to, to record um, or to, to, to do a session which EJ was actually going to give at that time. Um, now, I said the university was closed at that time. It was closed due to heavy snowfall. Um, and I apologize for our US and Canadian friends in Scotland. Heavy, snow sn heavy snowfall closing a university means probably about a foot or like half a foot of snow. Um, but nevertheless, it was freezing cold and uh, I know EJ, I'm not sure whether you came from Bangladesh or the US at the time, but you were definitely not prepared for the cold we, we had for you. Um, coincidentally, the talk uh, that we recorded that day was called Thriving in a Rapidly Changing World. Um, so already two and a half years ago, this is kind of very much ahead of your time. Um, as I said before, in St Andrews, we've run these kind of summer leadership uh, uh, sessions uh, for a number of years, and EJ has um, been kind enough to kind of uh, tune in last time it was from uh, from Bangladesh actually um, to to give one of the, the talks to our scholars and we had a great discussion afterwards so I'm really looking forward to this. Um, EJ was also part of the kind of leadership bazaar um, those people who might recall back to the Laidlaw conference that we ran in St Andrews in this October 2018 oh, that's quite a while ago um, so we had a whole host of, of, of people who joined in and kind of participated in a number of talks around leadership. Um, now, a little bit about EJ. Um, if you've, you, I hope you might have had a look at his LinkedIn profile. Um, if you can see, see all the kind of host of accolades and, uh, and awards he's got. Um, been a, a speaker at TEDx and Dakar and uh, I encourage you to have a look at some of those talks. They're quite interesting. Um, uh, it's also got uh, awards from the Foreign Commonwealth Office International Leaders Program, um, Creative Young Entrepreneur of the Year Awards, um, you know, Global Emerging Leader Awards. Um, so, so, so we're really in good hands listening to EJ and, and listening to his stories. Um, the reason why we have EJ or why EJ is around quite a lot uh, in St Andrews as well is because he's a graduate and an honorary lecturer. Uh, so that's how we managed to convince him to come along and thanks very much for that EJ. Um, so that's just a selection of, of some of the, the background things for EJ, but uh, um, his main thing really is to, to, to run the BYLC, so the Bangladesh Youth Leadership Centre, and, uh, and that's grown quite considerably if you think, um, if you go back to its, its early years, 2008, when kind of EJ was at Harvard and kind of developed it there, um, it kind of came from a, a very small 10k uh, social enterprise living room project into now having a, a massive operating budget and, and 80 plus full-time staff um, and EJ will talk, tell us a bit more about it but uh, they do a lot of leadership training um, and especially this leadership in action is, is, is something I'm very keen to hear more about because 
um, as you all know, this is something that we as the, the lay law scholars um, are looking to kind of uh, bring forward and, and, and get you to do a bit more about as well. Um, and uh, so without uh, taking up much more of your time, AJ, I'll just hand over to you. If you do have any questions, guys, just type them down in the text. Um, as I said in the email, the session is being recorded as well. Um, and yeah, so hopefully we'll have a really interesting discussion um, at the end and, uh, and, and post your questions. Um, over to you, EJ. Thank you, uh, Alex, uh, for that very generous uh, introduction. I'm delighted uh, to be here. And uh, we, Alex, you told me we have about an hour. Yeah. So uh, perhaps I could speak for about 35, uh, 35 40 minutes max and then have a conversation if, uh, if participants you know, have questions, comments. I think that would also be useful. I was uh, coming into this session, I was not entirely clear how uh, I can add value to the conversation. So, so the way I've structured my talk is I will tell you a bit about my story, how I came about to starting uh, BYLC, some of the lessons uh, that I've learned while running the organization for the past 12 years, uh, some sort of reflections on what it takes to start an organization and some reflections on uh, the leadership journey of a young professional entering into this uncertain world, um, particularly in this COVID-19 era. I will, uh, let me just sh share my presentation. Can we all see this? Okay. Um, okay. So I'll start with a small story about how I uh, how I got into leadership education. So I was born and raised uh, in Bangladesh, you know, grew up in a middle-class family. My father was a professor at uh, Dhaka University. He used to teach management. And when I was 15, I, uh, I got introduced to the field of leadership. I read a book by John Adair called Effective Leadership, and I was fascinated by it. Uh, when I was 18, uh, I uh, chose to come to St. Andrews. It was primarily my father's decision because he had been there before. So he just said, okay, it's a good place You go there. And I got on a plane first time in my life when I was 18 and I landed in London, then took a train to Lucas and then, you know, in the middle of nowhere, I'm in St. Andrews. In my first week uh, at St. Andrews, I uh, ran to be the hall representative and I lost to one of my close friends, Nat. That was my first failure at St. Andrews. And then I read economics for four years, but I was uh, more passionate about politics when I was at St. Andrews. I was, you know, hanging out going to at least 10 pubs in a night, meeting people, socializing. So I, I was very active in the students' association uh, and in different clubs and societies. In my final year, for four years at St. Andrews, uh, I, I, I was fascinated uh, by the possibility of becoming the first, you know, sort of the non-white president of the students' association. And when you're 21, you, you think of life in a very linear way. Okay, I'm going to become the president of the Students' Association. Then one day I'm going to become the president of my country. So it's a, it, that's, you know, a very simplistic way of looking at life. So I ran for this election. I put in a lot of effort. Uh, and then I lost. And when I lost the election, it was a defining moment in my life. Uh, I thought this was the end of my life. I could never uh, have any future in politics or in leadership. And after I lost that election in... Uh, uh, in 2003, in my final year at St. Andrews, I was so heartbroken and it had such a profound impact on me that till to date, I'm 39 now, I have never ever contested for any election after that experience. So I came back to Bangladesh in 2003. I started uh, working as an economist and I was reflecting on my failure that, you know, what happened? Why did I lose the election? Uh, what went wrong? I worked so hard. So I, I had a lot of questions about leadership. And I was working as an economist for, uh, you know, for two years in Bangladesh. 
Um, while I was also working in Bangladesh, one of my realizations was Bangladesh is a poor country, not because of money, but because of leadership. And if you can change the quality of leadership, uh, then you can change the country. So that was my thinking, but I did not know a lot about leadership at that time. So I thought, let me uh, take a safer option, go to graduate school, learn a bit more about leadership and then see uh, what options I have. So I uh, went to Harvard Kennedy School. I enrolled in the master's in public policy. It's a two year program. And uh, you have to, one has to take about uh, 19 courses to graduate. 18 compulsory, one you can take 19. Out of my 19 courses at the Kennedy School, 11 of them were on leadership. So I took every single course on leadership by you know, all the famous professors because I was so you know, curious to learn more about this subject. Um, then in 2008, when I was graduating, 2007, I came back to Bangladesh. I, I, I worked in the community. In 2008, I had to make a decision that you know, I could either come back to Bangladesh. I had a job at the World Bank in Washington, D.C. at that time uh, to work as a consultant. And uh, I, with a co-founder, also got a $10,000 award. I had a co-founder. She was a student at MIT a second year student who is now my wife. But you know, at that point, we wrote the proposal of a leadership center together. So in 2008, I took the decision that I'm going to come back to Bangladesh with $10,000. I did not have a robust business plan. And this is my uh, one reflection on uh, for all of you who are thinking of some starting something on your own. I think I can say with some uh, level of confidence that Far too many people spend a lot of time polishing, preparing business plans, but starting something and preparing a business plan, these are two different, totally different things. And I've met so many people coming out of MIT 100K business plan competitions. They win the awards, but they don't start a business or they don't stick around with that. So I did not have a robust business plan. I just had a two pager. But I knew this is what I wanted to do. And I knew that I was committed. I would figure things out. So I came back to Bangladesh. I ran a pilot program. And, uh, and, uh, and since 2008, we just, uh, you know, we, we launched it. So when I was starting BYLC in 2008, um, I applied for a prize. It's called the Davis Peace Prize in the US. So I was passionate about leadership and I had to apply uh, for a peace prize. So I had to connect leadership with peace. And then I, when I looked at Bangladesh, we have three different types of education. We have the British curriculum, we have the religious curriculum, we have the national curriculum, the Bengali curriculum. And kids from these backgrounds don't interact. So I thought, let me bring them together. So that would you know, foster inclusiveness and tolerance. So that's, that's how we got into this you know, peace, building, uh, peace building work that has been central to BYLC for the past 12 years. But that was also an accident because I happened to apply to a peace prize and I had to connect leadership with peace. But then when I first started this program in 2008 in the pilot program, we saw it made a huge difference because kids who went to the British education system rarely interacted with madrasas, you know, and people wearing a cap and a beard. They have a lot of misconceptions. So we were breaking these barriers. Uh, so the first challenge we addressed is a uh, fragmented education system, bring, bring them together. Second is the curriculum in uh, Bangladesh is primarily reliant on rote learning. Uh, there is no critical thinking, problem solving uh, in our courses. So we introduce that in the curriculum. And these are the two challenges that we started with. After running BYLC for five years, what I saw is many of our young people uh, who came from underprivileged backgrounds were now entering the job market. And once they uh, got into the job market, they were struggling to find jobs. And the vision of BYLC was to create this inclusive society where young people can have high impact in different sectors. But I started asking myself, that if our alumni don't have jobs, then how will they change the world? Because they cannot support themselves. So after running BYC for five years, I got into, uh, I got into connecting young people to, to jobs. 
So after five years, leadership education, instilling values of tolerance, inclusiveness, and then placing young people in jobs. I'll explain this in a bit. So the first was this building bridges to leadership training program. That's our signature program. This is what we started with. This is a 10 week long program for A-level students and first and secondary university students. It's an after school program. Then we have, so one challenge I had with uh, these alumni from the BBLT program is how do we keep them engaged beyond the 10 weeks? So then we came up with another program for secondary school kids, which is the Building Bridges to Leadership Training Junior. It's a month long program for kids in grade six to 10. And alumni of the first program teach young people in the second program. And at least my experience has been, um, I learned a lot more about leadership when I started teaching leadership. Because you know, when I was uh, taking all these courses, I did not do all the readings. But when I started teaching it, people started asking me difficult questions. So I had to really uh, do all the readings and think a lot more deeply. Uh, so, so, so to foster the leadership capacity of our alumni, we thought maybe if we can engage them in teaching, that will strengthen their understanding of the subject. So that's the uh, building bridges to leadership training junior. When we were running these two for the first few years, a lot of university third and fourth day students came to us and said, you know, why don't you do something for us? So then we came up with this executive course. And then we have a residential boot camp, and then we have a leadership summit, which is a Davos kind of event where we have speakers from different countries, um, young people from Bangladesh and around the world convene for three days of knowledge sharing and engagement. So the journey of BYLC, first we started with leadership education. I was passionate about this. I wanted to make a difference. Then I got into jobs because we realized that there are not enough jobs, uh, you know, for our alumni. And then once we started placing young people in jobs, we started working with employers. We co-created curriculum with the employers. So we go to employers, we organize these round tables uh, with you know, leading newspapers. We find out what employers want. And then we create that curriculum through the Office of Professional Development. This is our alumni engagement office. And we place young people in jobs. Um, but about 2 million young people enter the job market every year in Bangladesh. There are 200,000 jobs. So clearly there are not enough jobs in the country. So then we thought we need to get into uh, investing. We need to help create entrepreneurs. So the first idea in 2016 was to give 10 grants to young people, to groups of young people to start their own projects. All 10 of them failed. That's another major failure for BYLC. And what I learned is, it's not enough to give young people money to launch their business. You need to constantly monitor them. You need to build their capacity. They need a lot of handholding. So now what we have done is we have uh, the BYLC Ventures, which is a six month long accelerator program. You have a business idea. Right now we are accepting, you know, we are screening applications. We received 450 uh, applications from young founders we will take 100 of them to a boot camp. We are going to build their capacity. And then finally, they'll pitch to an investment committee. 10 of them will come to our accelerator program. We are going to build their capacity. We give them seed funding. If you do well, then we you know, help you uh, scale up. We give you some funding for scaling up your business. And our plan is to invest in uh, 40 uh, ventures in the next four years. We've already made four investments. We'll make another 10 investments in 2020. So that's how I got into the ventures side of things. So if you look at our journey, it was not you know, very much like a plan on day one. We have tried to learn from our mistakes and evolved as, uh, as the needs of young people in Bangladesh changed. Um, So I've been based in Bangladesh for the last 12 years, but I travel quite a bit for my work. And when I'm traveling to different places, uh, you know, I'm meeting a lot of exciting people and trying to learn where the, you know, where the future is. About five years ago, I came, uh, I came, you know, 
I've been traveling to US quite a bit and my wife, uh, she was doing the MBA at Stanford and MPID at Harvard. So I split my time between Silicon Valley and Boston. So I've been spending a lot of time here. And when I came to Silicon Valley, I, I started meeting people at Udacity, Coursera, all of these, you know, organizations. And I was fasc fascinated by the, uh, by the possibility of online education. And the reason online education resonated with me is in Bangladesh, we have a scale problem. I have a scale problem because I live in a country of 160 million people. I don't have enough resources to run programs for 10,000 young people uh, every year. I cannot do that physically because I don't have the infrastructure. So, so we started looking at online opportunities. Um, BYLCX is our online academy, uh, which in the future may, you know, may spin out um, as an edtech company out of BYLC. Right now it's part of BYLC. We have 45 online courses for young people. These are all self-paced, meaning that you can just you know, sign up to your online courses. And, uh, and it's quite timely for us because we just launched the new website last month in the midst of this lockdown in Bangladesh, uh, which uh, sort of worked quite well because every, you know, all the students are at home. So they're taking these online courses. Uh, so we have two types of online courses. One is the self-paced like Coursera that you can take it at your own pace. And the other is instructor led. The instructor led is like a Zoom and then we have breakout rooms. There is facilitation, there is feedback. It's just like your class at, you know, at university. Uh, it's just online. So that, that's how we are running BYLCX and we are investing heavily on BYLCX and all of these programs, if you look at all of these programs, okay, uh, the Youth Leadership Summit is a Davos kind of event. I, I have a video, I'll, I'll try to show it to you or I'll send you the link. Um, this summit is a very big physical gathering and before 2020, our thinking was it had to happen uh, in a physical grand hotel. Uh, you know, speakers will fly in from all over the world. But then when this coronavirus uh, happened in March, uh, we spoke amongst ourselves in, in Dhaka. And I said to my colleagues, listen, guys, you know, everything is moving online. And if we are moving online, then why should we be competing? with Bangladeshi organizations? Why can my customers not be based in Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, Africa, Europe? What's stopping me if I'm going online? So, so we took that risk and we said, okay, let's do a South Asia Youth Resilience Summit because young people are facing a lot of crisis. You know, jobs will disappear. Uh, there will be a lot of frustration. So let's organize a South Asia Youth Resilience Summit. We had the chairman of Intel, um, He's the CEO of Medtronic, which is a $43 billion company. Very hard to reach these people. We got two Harvard professors. But when I wrote to them and I said, hey, you know, I'm organizing the South Asia Youth Resilience Summit. Will you commit one hour? And they said, you know, well, I'm staying at home. So I'll, I'll give you one hour. So we got these speakers and we organized a South Asia Youth Resilience Summit. And that was fantastic. And what, what that did for us is it taught us that sometimes we think this is the only way this problem can be solved. But unless you try something different, you never know. Our Building Bridges Through Leadership Training program since 2008 has always been happening in a physical space. But we have taken this fully online. And our plan is for the next one year, all of our programs will be online. This has been a big adaptation for us. Uh, but we realize that this is what we need to do to, to survive um, because the new normal is not going to look anything like what the world was in 2019. So we have moved all of our you know, courses online. We are having some difficulty in monetizing, in charging fees. Uh, just to tell you a bit about the business model of BYLC, 95% of our funding comes from donors like DFID, like the Dutch government, um, IKEA Foundation and 5% we charge to the students because our target market, uh, middle income, lower middle income, 
uh, underprivileged young people don't have the paying capacity uh, for our courses. So we have to subsidize our courses, mm -hmm. but we take a nominal fee from students because students need to have ownership. If everything is free, then people don't value what they get. So that's how the business model is organized. Um, I have a couple of videos. Alex, shall we try to see if they if they work? Oh, yeah, yeah, just give it a go. Um, and uh, if not, we can always share the the links afterwards as well. Yeah, let me let us just see if it. Uh, then I think. It'll... Can you can you hear the sound? No, it's too quiet, DJ. It's too quiet. Okay. Yeah. Let me just see. Modern technology is uh, it's, it's still in the learning process. It's still in the learning process. Yeah. What does it take How about now? It's not it's not great. No, it's a bit quiet. Uh, it depends on how loud your speaker is. So if you just make it louder in your computer. Yeah, I made the speaker quite loud. Yeah, for some reason. I'll, I'll share the links. How about that? Will that, will that be better? Yeah, that might be easier, EJ. You share the links and, and yeah. I'll make everybody get some. Okay. Okay. Um. Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm using a lot of different equipments. It's a, um, but I'll share the link. Okay. Um, I'll talk a bit about our alumni, where our alumni are. And uh, then maybe I can take some questions. I have a few more ideas that I want to expand, expand on, but uh, I'd love to hear your reflections and then maybe I can build up on that. So for the past 12 years, our, uh, our alumni have done very well in different sectors. We have graduates in Bangladesh who have gone into Navy, uh, the Army, uh, in civil service, internationally. Many of them, you know, coming from madrasas have gone on to win Commonwealth Scholarship at Oxford. Uh, at, this, at this time, we have three, three of our students at Oxford. One of them got admissions. Uh, in American top, you know, top institutions. So our alumni uh, have done quite well, but the biggest challenge that we have with our alumni network is keeping young people engaged because once young people, you know, complete our program, then they're gone. How do you, you know, keep on bringing them back uh, so that they're connected to the purpose of the organization? That's a big challenge for us. And uh, we have an alumni association, which is run by an elected elected board. But that's a challenge that we are working on every day, keeping alumni engaged. And that's sort of one of my reflections on universities. You know, St. Andrews has done a good job by reaching out to me and trying to keep me engaged, you know, coming back and engaging with, with, with students. Uh, this is something that we try with our alumni as well. But this is a... Uh, uh, a big challenge for us. So this is our center in Dhaka. We have a very open space, entrepreneurs. Uh, this is a sort of a lab, classrooms. So our, our vision is to scale our programs uh, nationally. 
we want to you know train about 50,000 young people through online and blended because we are moving all our programs online and we, we are scaling up our ventures program because when we think about developing country like Bangladesh I think you need to get the economy right you need to get the you know uh, if people don't have uh, if people don't have access to livelihood options they cannot be productive members of society so that's something that we you know that that we, we are focusing on a lot right now that we need to give the education the leadership but also uh, the job placement and the entrepreneurial opportunities. If you can combine the two, people have the right skills, values, and they have livelihood options, then they can be productive members of society and contribute to society. So that's how we are looking at uh, our work moving forward. So maybe I can pause there and take a few questions or hear your reflections. Yeah, thanks, AJ. So, uh, if you if anybody has any questions, please just uh, post them into the chat. Um, but uh, I I might, uh, or you could also raise your hand. Um, we can unmute you. That's that's an option here as well. Um, I I'll, I'll kick you off with a with a question while other people are are thinking about about their questions, if you don't mind. Um, and you you talked a little bit about the kind of um, kind of start making a difference. And I was wondering um, if you've got any advice for the scholars as to, you know, if you're sitting there and you're going, oh, so who am I, who am I to make a difference? How can I go about starting to make a difference or have an impact? Um, how can I bring my leadership to, to actually do something? Um, my first, my first uh, comment on that would be, leadership is action leadership is not just limited to understanding and thinking of course thinking is a part of it analytical ability diagnosing a problem these are important skills but unless we apply we get to action uh, leadership really doesn't make a difference so so the first step is having a bias towards action whatever issue you care about because we also know that people only exercise leadership about issues they care about. I started BYLC because I really cared about leadership. I had a lot of scars from my failures. I was passionate about it. So I, I started an organization around leadership. Someone may care about climate change or equality or something else. And it's not necessary to start an organization, but what's important is uh, starting something uh, it can be in the community. It can be in your, you know, academic institutions. Uh, if if you can mobilize people around you to face a difficult issue or make progress on a common challenge, then I think that is an act of leadership. And all of you uh, in this in this discussion, I think, intuitively know that leadership is not the same as holding a position. It's not the same as a title. Leadership is the ability to make a difference, to mobilize people. And anyone can do it, regardless of our age, gender, position. All of us have the opportunity to exercise leadership. So I would invite everyone to, uh, to first reflect on what you care about, what is the issue that matters most to you, and then think how you can uh, mobilize other people to make a difference, to make progress on that issue. Hmm. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, someone had their hand up. I don't know whether you took your hand down because we were talking, but if you had your hand up, could you unmute yourself uh, and talk? Otherwise, I'll read one of the questions from the chat. That question was still there. Oh, question is gone. Well, we do we we do have some questions in the chat. Uh, would you like yeah. to read them, please? <laughs> yeah? I uh, we can uh, sure I can see them. So, so maybe we should start with uh, Wingshua, um, who, who asked about the kind of the balance of entertaining new ideas and staying true to the, uh, the founding vision of the idea. What do you think about that? So, yeah, so I, I think there is a there is a fine balance that one needs to 
uh, one needs to find. You cannot be so committed to your idea because if you're just fully committed to your idea, then you're going to miss, uh, miss other opportunities. They'll go past you and you'll not see them because all you, all, you know, you're looking at a square and all you see is a square and there may be big circles that are, you know, going past you and you won't even notice them. So I think you need to have some sense of purpose your purpose must be there. Why is it that you're driving this project? But the method of achieving that purpose may be different. So for BYLC, our purpose was, you know, we want to make a difference, improve the human condition, empower young people. And leadership education was a vehicle. It was not the only thing. We started off with leadership education, but then we got into many other different things. And not all of the ideas came from me. We have a management committee. They sit, they come up with ideas. Uh, some of the ideas, for example, the Building Bridges to Leadership Training Junior Program, which was our second program, that idea did not come from me. You know, uh, I agreed to it when I heard it, but it came from some of our alumni. They said, hey, listen, we want to give back. Can we run this program? Can we raise money for it? So they raised some money and they launched the program. And now it's part of our core program. So if I understood the question correctly, if you have a vision, other people have lots of ideas in a team, how do you navigate that? Of course, you must have consensus around the purpose. Otherwise, if, if there is no consensus around the common purpose, the team cannot function. But you must also be open to listening to people with opposing ideas, because many of the times people with opposing ideas may not be right, but 10% of the time, they may give you, you know, such valuable advice that can turn your project, that can be a defining moment for your project. So having that openness and tolerance to listening to diverse opinion, I think is, is healthy and, uh, and important for the success of a project or, or organization. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I thought it was a good answer there. And I think you, you kind of highlight that with, with your journey that you've taken with BYLC as well, kind of going from one direction and staying true to it, but adding other things in and taking things away as, as you go along. Um, there's another question here. Um, uh, let's have a look uh, from uh, Lara, uh, who, who asks about... Um, but what you think the benefits can be in reading about leadership or learning about leadership as compared to um, practicing it on, on your daily life? I think you need both because life is too short to make all the mistakes yourself, you know? So by reading, you know, you're learning about other people's mistakes, other people's reflections at the end of their career, they're writing about leadership. You know, if you read books on leadership by CEOs, uh, like Bill George, who was the former CEO of Medtronic, uh, you know, they've spent a lifetime building organizations. So when they talk about leadership, about managing people, hiring people, uh, there's a lot of value in that. Uh, or if you read about, you know, public leadership, political leadership, I think there's a lot that can be learned. And, uh, and the, the importance is to spend time learning, but also practicing it. There is no value for society if all you do is you just learn. You're reading, which is fantastic, but you're not applying it. So then society doesn't benefit. So you have to find a balance between learning and application. Um, and successful leaders, in my opinion, offer a combination of both. They have the intellectual curiosity, they're learning, they have the, you know, the, uh, the solid understanding of the subject, but they can also practice it, practice it and improvise, understanding that leadership is improvisational to the extent that, you know, I'm fascinated by biographies. You know, I, you know, I love reading uh, memoirs of, you know, Obama, from Clinton when I was young. I'm learning for them, but I cannot build my life on Obama's life because I'm not Obama. I am myself. And my first realization about this came when I was at St. Andrews because when I was at St. Andrews, 
How many people in this audience are from St. Andrews? 50%? Not quite. Not, Not quite. quite, okay. 40, 40 students? 40 students, okay. So when I was there, you know, my accent was different because I was trying to fit in and you go to these balls, I was going to the Kate Kennedy Club ball and all of these things. But then, and my parents loved it. They appreciated my accent because, you know, they invested a lot in my education. Every time I used to come back to Bangladesh, they said, wow, you know, you're making good use of our investment. And then I went to the US and then I met a lot of American friends. I came back. By the time I started BYLC, I was comfortable in my own skin. I'm a brown guy. I'm a Bangladeshi guy. I've lived in the UK. I've lived in the US, but I am who I am. I'm not British. I'm not American. And there's no point in me, you know, copying someone else's accent or trying to be someone else. I need to be comfortable in my own skin. And this is what in leadership language we, we talk about is authenticity. You know, when you find your own voice, yourself, who you are, what you care about, then you can build your life around that. And you can take action on the things that you care about, uh, as opposed to reading about something and trying to copy that. I'm not Steve Jobs, so there's no point in me trying to you know, create another iPhone. So we are not, at, at least at BYLC, we're not trying to create the next Coursera or edX. We are just creating BYLC, which helps young people build their leadership skills instill in them values because we believe values are important to be a good human being connects them to jobs and help helps them become entrepreneurs so that's our sort of we have learned from other models but that's our unique way of presenting the work that we do oh that's a really good answer thanks very much i think i think also from from a lot of what we do as a laid law scholars it's you know, when, when you try and learn from other people's experiences, if you read something, you might retrospectively reflect on something that you've done in your behavior, and it will help you kind of quantify it a little bit more. So, so this is perfect. Um, can I just ask you a follow on? Uh, you were talking about BYLCX there. Um, and um, I know we, we had this question or a fairly similar question in one of the other talks a couple of weeks ago. How do you deal with the, um, with the kind of the challenge of of, of actually accessing online if you're in an environment which is, you know, where you don't have lots of money, where you don't have uh, a unique uh, internet access or where you might need to share a computer or have a mobile phone. How do you kind of address the fact that a lot of the people who, who are your customers in that case um, might struggle to, to make use of the infrastructure you're offering? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I'm actually putting together a proposal now for one of the embassies that uh, we are proposing two things. One is we are doing advocacy work in Bangladesh around free public internet, particularly in a post COVID-19 world. Um, education is disrupted in Bangladesh. And opportunities are not equal for young people from remote areas, from you know underserved communities. They don't have access to internet. They cannot take online courses. I think it's about time the whole world offered you know, free public internet for educational purposes. Wouldn't that be amazing? You know, we have enough money in the world to, to, to make that happen. So that's something that we, we are doing some advocacy on. The second is we are writing some proposals uh, for, you know, $50 tablets that we give these tablets to young people in, you know, in communities where they don't have internet, they can, you know, have access our content offline that's one, the tablets. The other is we are also exploring opportunities of partnering with telecommunication companies that we just give them for a ten, you know, for a ten dollar, uh, you know, SIM card, a mobile SIM. You can have like a three G connection uh, for a month. Good data packs. So if those kind of uh, opportunities can be created for young people, then they can access online education. The mobile phone infrastructure is quite strong in many developing countries in South Asia. Uh, I, I, I know this is the case in Pakistan, Sri Lanka, India, Bangladesh, you know, across our countries. So, uh, so partnering with the private sector in creating these, you know, opportunities for data packages for more young people can, can, uh, can create more opportunities for people who, who are falling behind. Well, that's great. Great answer. Thanks very much. Um, and I hope that answers the question that was raised uh, last week. Um, 
slightly different tack here. We had uh, Aaron ask the question about uh, how you kind of kept yourself motivated through it all. How did you kind of keep your enthusiasm and uh, and deal with kind of being faced with failure and things like that? So this is a a tough question. I can I can tell you what I did, which I'm not sure if it's the right approach, right? But uh, all my life, I have been the hundred percent kind of guy. Like whatever I did in my life, I never had a backup plan. I, you know, I wanted to do something and I went all in. And and this is not the advice any investor would give you. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. But I always put all my eggs in one basket. And uh, and that's why uh, even at St Andrews, you know, I was so disappointed and heartbroken because. Everything I did, I just put everything on that election and I lost everything. When I came back to Bangladesh, when I applied to graduate school, I put all my eggs in one basket. I just applied to one school. I got very lucky, which I don't advise people to do. It's just, you know, anything could have happened. And when I started BYLC, I put all my eggs in one basket and I, I, I felt... Uh, I'm sure most of you have seen the film Titanic, like the in the closing scenes of the of the film the captain who knows the ship is going to sink but he's still uh, in his cabin he lights up a cigar uh, he's wearing a suit he's very composed because the captain cannot leave the ship because he has pride it's my ship this ship is sinking but i own this if it goes under water i'm going to go under water with it and that that that, that is what you know uh, helped him to stay calm in that moment of uncertainty and crisis. So for me, this is how I looked at BYLC for the last 12 years, that, you know, this is my life. If BYLC goes down, I go down with it, but I'm not going to leave the ship. So this is how I've looked at it till uh, 2019, right? And that is what helped me stay motivated because I did not have a plan B that if this fails, I'll do this. But I really don't know if this is the right strategy in life. Um, but this is what worked for me. And, and the reason I say, I don't know if this is the right strategy because it can also cause a lot of harm to people, you know? Um, can I suggest a different tack of that? Because I think, you, you know, you said you'd hang on to BYLC if it went down. But I would almost be prepared to, to bet on the fact that if BYLC went down, you would re-emerge a little bit later with some other idea and something you put all your eggs in one basket to, to follow in. So maybe it's a little bit about kind of taking ownership and really being convinced by the ideas that you're following and being so convinced, maybe to a fault, maybe, but being so convinced that that this is the right thing to do and the right thing to follow. And that gives you a lot of kind of commitment and a lot of drive with it as well. Um, Possib possibly, Alex, you know, but priorities change over time. I mean, right now, BYLC is a priority, but like, you know, as I said, I'm 39, I've got two kids. My family lives in Silicon Valley, so I'm splitting my time and I'm spending a lot more time in the US. So, uh, so priorities change, but, um, but having some clarity around your purpose, you know, what matters most to you can help us stay connected to our goals. That's an interesting, an interesting one. Uh, maybe one for, for a continued scholar conversation as well. Um, quite topical as well if you're doing a research project right now. Uh, we have another uh, question by, by James, um, and he kind of talks with reference to the recent changes caused by the, the COVID crisis. Um, how common is it for change to be driven by external factors and uh, necessity? Um, or is it more common that the internal ideas of kind of progress and change have driven your project? I think both. Uh, COVID-19 uh, has greatly impacted um, our operations, our organization, our business model, even the businesses that we fund um, before it was one, you know, one kind of thinking, you know, we're not going to invest in travel companies in this environment. Uh, we know that for sure. We're going to invest in e-commerce, in distribution, in fintech, in cashless transactions. 
So most of the businesses we will invest in right now is online, uh, not businesses that require a lot of physical distribution network or physical uh, capacity. Even for our organization, our funding has been affected. So you have to take tough decisions in, in these uh, environments. A lot of it is out of your control. Um, but what is in our control is how we respond, how quickly we can respond and how we can adapt. I think that is something uh, that, that determines in the long run, the success, uh, you know, the, the level of success of an organization is how quickly we can respond. Uh, for example, as soon as, you know, from mid-March our office has been closed, and we are having to take a lot of tough decisions because in 2019, our business model was focused on physical programs. Uh, we had a different kind of, you know, uh, uh, different skill set of people that we needed in the organization. But right now we need a lot more people on social media, on, you know, BYLCX, on online education. It requires a different skill set. So the tough question is how quickly can you train some of your, you know, staff to transition to that and if you cannot train some of them then how do you sort of you know help them find something that they care about and you attract talent that you can you know that that can meet the goals of the organization and these are very tough uh, tough questions um, so in summary i think covid19 the external threats are tremendous and for any entrepreneur uh, how quickly we can respond uh, to this is going to be crucial for our survival. Yeah. Yeah, thanks very much. That's a, that's a good answer, I think. Um, right, uh, Rory asked a question, um, and he was wondering whether you could expand a little bit more on the kind of interesting points you made about charging uh, students a discounted fee for the, the course uh, to give them the ownership. Um, and do you also find a need to offer scholarships to those who cannot afford to pay even a discounted fee? Or are these not kind of part of your target audience? Um, if you do, do you notice that these scholars uh, have a lack of ownership as a result of kind of having not to pay? Uh, yeah, or is there a kind of a reduction in the success rate of those scholars? That's a great question. So, um... First thing is at BYLC, uh, we don't use the term scholarship because our understanding is scholarship is merit-based. We give financial aid, which is need-based. So uh, the amount of funding we provide has nothing to do with your talent or merit. Uh, it's to do with your family income level. So uh, if you come from a certain uh, segment of population, if your parents' income is before, uh, below a certain level, then we give you financial aid, we give you funding. And, uh, but seldom will we make it 100% free. Even if it's you know, a very nominal $5, people have that ownership. And when we started in 2008, for the first two years, all our programs were 100% free. And what we observed is, you know, students don't turn up to classes on time. Uh, there is a lack of seriousness. They feel a lot more entitled. Uh, when they pay, they value it. You know, people need to attach a sense of value to your, uh, to your, to your service. And my evolution as an entrepreneur has been that I believe now that you should not offer anything for free because when people pay, they care about what they're getting and there are innovative ways of financing, you know, which is some, some of the things that we are looking at right now because of COVID-19. If our donor funding goes down, how are we going to run our programs? You charge the full fee, but have creative financing. Don't pay me anything now. Uh, if we help you find a job over the next five years, pay me a small amount uh, from your salary every month. So it's a win, win for you. It's a win for us. It works out both ways. So these are some you know, financing models that we are being forced to explore now uh, because the donor landscape is changing because of COVID-19. Yeah, that can be quite a challenge, can't it be? But it also highlights the strength of the importance of having a kind of strong network of alumni and people staying in touch after they, they finish the program, doesn't it? 
I think that's something we're trying to achieve with Laidlaw. So all of the scholars who are here now, we don't just hope that they sit here for two years, listen to the talks and enjoy the program, but we hope that they come back and they give back and, and we're, we're slowly seeing that. So, so I think that's, uh, that's quite an important aspect of it, isn't it? Um, right, so we have a lot of questions coming in. <laughs> that is very good. Um, also, people, if you'd like to raise your hand and unmute yourself and ask a question, that's, uh, that's also an option. We extra chose this mode of delivery so, so, so you can have more of a face-to-face. -face. I know you've all gone and hidden behind your blacked-out cameras, but, uh, but that option is definitely there. Um, and I'll give preferential treatment to those people. Um, uh, someone here, uh, Gwendolyn, asked, uh, what has been your favorite memory at, uh, of your time at BYLC? Um, what do you think is an underrated joy of working in such a po uh, position and leading your organization? Uh, I, I am uh, currently working with a coach um, to help me figure out my next steps, BYLC's next steps. So part of the exercise with my coach was uh, to identify moments where I felt most alive at BYLC. And those moments for me were when we first launched our summit, when we created something new. I think I get a lot of energy when I'm building something new. Uh, so I, I felt a lot of excitement and energy when we did our first Youth Leadership Summit, when we launched the Ventures Program, when we launched BYLC X. So I get a lot of satisfaction. Uh, I get a lot of satisfaction from that. Uh, so those would be, uh, does that answer the question? Highlights of my time? Uh, was it Gwendolyn who asked that? Could you just? Yeah, it is. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Gwen. Um, Right, we've got another one here, uh, which is asking, uh, this is Anna, asking about um, uh, how do you ensure accessibility and diversity when online education is also dependent on accessibility to IT equipment? So we already had a little bit about that, um, but also kind of quiet areas and, uh, and kind of stable internet connections. Do you think an all online program will attract them? and better cater for a different demographic of groups compared to before? You know, online education is going to, uh, has the potential to democratize education. Now imagine how many people can go to top UK universities from the developing world, right? So the access is quite limited, but if uh, the top, you know, 50 universities in the UK opened up their courses online, a lot more people could uh, to, could access them at an affordable cost. Uh, people who can who have the uh, who can afford it can go to the UK for the physical experience because education is not just about your degrees; it's also about the experience in the campus, your friends, the social experience. But for some people, all they need is you know the basic degree, the knowledge, so that they can earn a living. And for those people, they can access it online. Yes there is the issue of internet connectivity and the equipment, but that's solvable problem. And what's important is it's a solvable problem with just hundred dollars as opposed to, I don't know how much money British universities charge right now at the undergraduate level. Um, Nine, 14,000, something like that. If I yeah, so, local, so, for local students. so 14, 15,000, you know, pounds a year versus 100 pounds a month, you know, 1200 pounds for equipment or not even 1200, you know, 500 pounds with equipment and monthly internet. Uh, that's a fraction of the cost uh, with which you can make that education available. Of course, the impact will not be the same, but at least the knowledge can be transferred. You, you can have some impact. Um, I think we have a very interesting follow on question from Aubrey, here, um, which kind of asks about the how the online leadership education can address the relational aspect of leadership. Um, so how do you think that leaders can be developed and learn tactics to relate to other people and the followers, uh, other leaders, if the program is uh, exclusively online? We are doing that, you know, uh, 
and we are finding that Zoom works fine for us. We break out the people in small groups. They have facilitated conversations in the breakout rooms. And just as the physical conversation you would have um, in a real world setting, we facilitate that online. Um, look, I think it's important for all of us to understand this is not, we are not living in an ideal world. In an ideal world, you want to live in the campus. But the problem with campus is uh, it's expensive. Not everyone can afford it. And second, with this COVID-19, the world is not returning to normal in any time soon, in the next one to two years, um, at least. So, um, so this is the next best thing. It's not perfect. It's not as good as physical, but this is the next best thing. I mean, I came to California uh, two weeks ago, I was on a flight, I was wearing a mask for two days. And when I, when I landed in New York, um, then I said to myself, I'm not getting on a plane uh, anytime soon because I don't enjoy wearing a mask. And this is, this is, the, this is the reality now. All of us will have to wear masks when, when we are traveling internationally. And many people will be reluctant to go overseas for higher education. Universities will have a lot of travel restrictions. Um, then what do you do? Do you stop education? Or do you go to the online recognizing that, you know, the impact, there will be a loss in impact, but at least uh, how can we optimize it and make it as good as we can? And that's what, uh, that's what we are trying at least uh, at BYLC. And many universities, uh, uh, many universities in Bangladesh are trying that. And I'll tell you some companies that are using AI and new technologies that are coming up, okay? So I'm talking to a lot of entrepreneurs uh, in South Asia. For example, one challenge is that Bangladeshi universities are facing is this exams, okay? So I give the content online, but when I'm taking an exam, how, how do I make sure that you're not cheating? Uh, in universities, there is sort of a tutor who's walking uh, down the aisle, uh, but there is software now that can just, you know, you turn the camera on and the software is going to monitor that, you know, it's just you who is giving the exam. It's not someone else. And they're coming up with all these new technologies uh, for, uh, for monitoring exams, online exams. And a lot more innovations will come. I can tell you for sure. Uh, what COVID-19 has done is it has accelerated this technological change that was going to come anyway in five years, that's going to come in the next six months to a year. Yeah. I think disruption generally always causes space for, for new ideas, for, for new leaders to step in and to, to take things forward and to, mm -hmm. to, to kind of take on new challenges. Um, another couple of questions, if you've still got time for it, we've got, still got a couple sure. to go through if you're still happy there. Um, so, uh, this is, uh, Sokriti, uh, who asked, um, is there any difference in your approach to equipping students who belong to a developing country rather than a developed one? Um, what would be some of the unique features, uh, of the BOLC programs that are more specific or suitable to Bangladesh rather than, uh, more economically rich countries? Okay. Um. I think our model, first of all, you know, I, I took my model from a rich country, right? It was an American education, American leadership model, which I took back to Bangladesh, adapted it to meet the uh, learning needs of, of, uh, of Bangladeshi young people. I think our building bridges, the English medium, Bengali medium and Madrasa is unique in the context of Bangladesh. But if you look at uh, many developed countries. I, I don't spend a lot of time in the UK these days. I come, you know, once a year or once in two years, but I can talk a lot more about America. If you look at what's going on with the politics and with the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, there is a there is lot of uh, America, many developed countries are struggling with, uh, with inclusiveness and the model that we have, you know, teaching young people empathy teaching young people inclusiveness, teaching young people tolerance. These are universal values. It's just not a matter of a developing country or a developed country. We need these values everywhere. How can we get along despite our differences? How can we learn to coexist? And this is at the heart of you know, the BYC's leadership curriculum. And I think there is value uh, for this. And 
and as I say this, I was actually, I'm, I was in a conversation with a lawyer and we are getting a 501c3, which is a non-profit in the, in the US. We're getting incorporated in the US so that after running this in Bangladesh for 12 years, we can now think of ex exporting this model uh, or replicating this model in other countries uh, in Africa or if there are opportunities in other you know, developed countries. Okay. That sounds really interesting. So that's one big one big step to look out for BYLC America. BYLC global, but but these things take time, right? We are still at the very early stages. Hmm. Uh, we have a question here from Jillian who was wondering a little bit uh, whether you could say a little bit more about how you went about developing the curriculum um, and uh, and what you found as the most successful in inspiring young people. How I uh, developed the curriculum, I got that question. What was the second question? Um, kind of, uh, what you found is the most uh, successful bit to inspire the young people to do something with it. Okay. So the curriculum was, I had a professor uh, at the Kennedy School. His name is Ronald Heifetz. He was my mentor. And I did my master's uh, policy analysis exercise, which is sort of a dissertation, but in a public policies program, it's less academic, more you know, practical. So you work with a real world client. I had a client in Brazil. So I developed the business plan or the curriculum plan of BYLC uh, while I was a master's student at the Kennedy School. And our model is built upon adaptive leadership. And you can Google that, you can read up on that. Adaptive leadership, Ronald Heifetz. So that's where you know, the curriculum came from. And the basic idea of the curriculum is, uh, I'm also happy to share my presentation. I have some thoughts of my curriculum on the presentation. If anyone's interested, you can have a look yeah, later nice. on. If you send it to me, I'll uh, just I'll forward it into the group. Yeah. So. Um, so, so the basic idea of, of our leadership thinking is leadership is not position centric. Anyone can practice leadership regardless of authority or title. And being the CEO does not mean that you're doing leadership. Being the CEO means you're sitting in a position of authority. So there's a difference between leadership and authority. And the real work of leadership is to bring about a change in people's behavior. I think these ideas, these two ideas that leadership is distinct from authority and the real work of leadership is to bring about a change in behavior or what we call adaptive change uh, is, is quite profound for young people. So when, when our young people uh, get this idea that I don't need to be the mayor of a city to promote you know, uh, environment friendliness or environment cleanliness in my city, that's empowering for them. And then when they go to the community, because community service is a core part of our signature leadership programs for high school and college students. When they go to the community, they don't think about just technical interventions, like you know, giving people money. Uh, they think about how can you change people's behavior? So if it can be in a community or in a slum, teaching people how to wash hands, how to be more hygienic, uh, how to care more about you know, their health, so trying to diagnose problems and focusing on the behavioral side of the work is what, what we uh, encourage our young people. And, uh, and, and that is where they focus on when they go and work in the community. And I can send, I'm happy to send a couple of articles on adaptive leadership, this technical adaptive challenge, and what is the real work of bringing about change Happy to you know send that out as a as a follow up if people are interested. Absolutely, great. Um, maybe I'll ask one more question if that's okay with you, and um, then sure. uh, then we've got a couple more. I can I can maybe post them to you, and if, if you find some which are interesting, which you thought might be worth picking out, we could. Alex, I think listen, you know, uh, I, I, I'm respectful of people's time. I I am. I am available. I, I, you know, I am happy to go through all the questions, but people who have to leave should also feel free to just, just leave the conversation. I think that is also fine. You know, people have other things to do, but I, I have a bit of extra time. If, you know, if you want, I'm happy to uh, 
uh, stay a bit longer. Stay here. Yeah. Um, maybe at this stage, then let me let me thank you um, in the name of all all the Nailo scholars and everybody yeah. who's come in and joined in, and thank you to all the scholars who've who've joined the conversation. And I, I hope you take something something interesting away from it, uh, something maybe in, in encouraging and, and challenging for you. Um, so thanks very much for that. There's um, so we'll stay on um, in a minute. Uh, but if you would like to stay on and yeah and if some people are leaving what i want to say to uh, all of the late law scholars if if you know some of you are thinking of starting your own organization you want to start something want to have a chat i'm happy to have a follow on you know conversation with a you know with a smaller group uh, if i ca if i can be helpful for you I i'd be happy to contribute Oh, that's great thanks very much ej yeah um, just to pinpoint you if you are cho choosing to sign out um, next week, we've got two special events coming up for you. Uh, I think, I believe on the 23rd, we've got um, possibly an entrepreneurship panel from Tufts. And on the 25th of June, um, we actually have um, how to be a moral leader, uh, join the re revolution. And that's uh, a conversation with Susanna Kemp, the uh, CEO of the Laidlaw Foundation as well. Um, I see you you're hiding there in the background. Hi, Susanna. As well. Um, so, so we've got two great events coming up um, next week. Um, right, then thanks very much. And let's have a look. I, I do admit that I've jumped one or two questions along the way. So um, if anybody feels very strongly, you, um, you can give a reaction or, or raise your hand if you would like and unmute yourself and ask the question in person. And that will get your question to the forefront and answered quicker. Um, so far, we've not really had anybody step forward. Come on, guys, be bold. I uh, I extra chose this format so that you could speak. Ah, Jacobo, there we go. Hi, <laughs> hello, EJ. Thank you for hey. your day. Um, I have a question about the uh, South Asia Youth Resilience Summit, and yeah. it, sounds, it sounds amazing. And I wonder what kind of activities and contents did you um, employ to actually cultivate resilience, and also what kind of role uh, did the two Harvard professors had in the, in the summit? Yeah, uh, great questions. Let me just uh, give you the link. All of our sessions are on, it, it was a Facebook live event. Oh. It was a Facebook live event. Um, particularly, you can watch uh, Tarun Khanna's talk. Uh, he spoke a lot about resilience. And Ronald Heifetz was also there. He's the, you know, uh, founder of the Center for Public Leadership at Harvard. So he's also there. I have shared the link and you can go to the okay. website and okay. the talks are, uh, the talks are on YouTube. You can see it at your own time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cool. Uh, I'll do it as well. I'll there we go. Thank okay. you very much, Matt. Um, I was just wondering, you mentioned earlier on the importance of authenticity in a leader, that there's no point in trying to be somebody else and redo what they did. And that sounds like a really nice idea, but I was just thinking it would be a lot easier said than done. How do you actually go about finding your authentic self as a leader? You, you look at your own past, your own identity, where you came from, who you are, what matters to you, right? There are two things. One is your past. Uh, your past is about your family, your background, your upbringing, uh, your community. That, that's something. And the other is, what are the things that you value? What do you value in life? Is also going to shape who you are. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, so really being honest with yourself about wh what do I really value in life? And, you know, you'll, you'll figure out what you really value in life when you have conflicting priorities and you know, you're at this sort of fork and you have to pick one path. That's when your values get clarified to you. Like in 2008, I was on this, you know, at this fork that do I go back to Bangladesh and start a nonprofit or do I pursue my career as an economist? And that would have taken me on a different trajectory. Right? So, at that point, it clarified to me that what I valued was, you know, public service, uh, giving back to my country. So it, that, it clarified at that point, right? Mm -hmm. 
for me, the next turning point was I was teaching leadership. I was, you know, passionate about it. I liked teaching, but it's not a scalable model. When you have just one faculty, how many people can you teach? You can be a great university professor, but that's who you are, right? But the clarity that I got from asking myself and reflecting on my experiences is, is I'm also an entrepreneur and the entrepreneur in me was in conflict with the teacher in me because the entrepreneur wants to scale. The entrepreneur thinks of numbers, turnover, staff size, but the teacher cares about changing people's lives. So when I had this conflict, then I thought I, I, I could come to peace with myself by training other people to teach. So then I started a program for training faculty. And now I don't teach in all the programs, which is a personal loss, but I've accepted it because a part of me, the entrepreneur in me wants to also grow the organization. Okay. It's about reconciling different, different goals, different parts of yourself. It's about reconciling the different things that you value. Mm -hmm. If you value one thing and don't value the other thing it's very easy. But when you value both, how do you prioritize? And that will help you understand yourself better. Okay, that's given me a lot to think about. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Thank you for the talk. Now, I have a question. It's a bit more on a personal level, but I just want to know what your experience of St. Andrews left you. Because uh, like most of us, I believe today in the talk are from St. Andrews, actually, we're studying there, we're halfway. And so sometimes I kind of feel overwhelmed, both about like the talents of other students, but especially for like how many opportunities and things to do there are, I quite feel lost. So if there's like any opportunity or like any big takeaway that you would also suggest us to get from St. Andrews and that help you in your like future career and like everything you built, apart from uh, the student election that was an interesting like topic but even something more personal or even just a place something that like really kind of marked your St. Andrews experience um two things one is I think uh, when you're at a great institution like St. Andrews it's not what you learn inside the classroom that's going to define who you are it's always the outside the classroom experiences, you know, the friendships you make, the relationships you build, um, and the interpersonal skills. When I was at St. Andrews, because I was so active in politics, I used to go to different pubs and there are different types of people who go to different pubs, right? There was the Vic, there was the Westport and there were like different crowds go to different places. But my strength, and I did not realize it then was hanging out with people from very different backgrounds and being friends with everyone. And 20 years after that, I'm still doing the same thing. It's just the context has changed. I'm going to different embassy, different funders. I'm shaking hands. I'm meeting people. I'm pitching ideas. And so those skills were very useful for me. The other thing that, that I think for me personally, St. Andrews taught me was how to handle failure, which is a very important skill in life. Particularly in this COVID-19 environment, people will experience failure. People will experience disappointments. You know, your jobs, your job offers may take longer. A lot of people will lose jobs. Your dream education, you know, your graduation may happen virtually. So to deal with disappointment in life, and to be mentally strong, I think is critical uh, in today's uh, environment, global environment. And, and that's something I think uh, you learn from, from failures in life and from reflecting on your failures. So I think if there's one thing that I, that I would like you to uh, pick up from your experience from St. Andrews is, uh, your outside the classroom experiences um, and then being mentally strong that whatever comes your way you can uh, you can face it and being resilient does that uh, resonate yeah absolutely like there are so many societies like i've been involved in that's true like it's like every person you meet it's part of your experience and like leads you something but at the same time, at least for me, I'm coming from a small city. 
like it's a very different culture environment so this idea of like being strong or like going against also our own prejudice or ourselves and accept that we are not what we thought we are or like we can become better i think that's very important and it's a very challenging environment for development so yeah i think yeah but 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 you know the world is going to force you to be out of your comfort zone there is no way around it and i think uh, before the world forces you if you can push yourself out of your comfort zone while at university you're ahead of the curve you have you know made some progress um I think it's worth that let me just yeah push in here as well highlighting that a lot of you scholars have had a fixed idea of what research project you're going to do for your late law summer and a lot of them are a lot of you are now doing different projects so it's about you know just accepting that sometimes things happen and uh, and you just need to go and deal with them and, and as you said EJ, I think resilience is a is a really good really good thing to, to yeah. try and build up as well Great. Let's take a couple more questions. We can then summarize. Um, Mathilde, did you have a question there? Uh, yeah, yeah. And then we'll go to uh, uh, Preksha after that. Oh, hello. So thank you for your talk. Uh, I had a question because you mentioned having a mentor. And so I was quite curious how you got about maybe approaching someone or maybe a program to get that mentor. And also how you negotiate like this notion of being an individual and having like role models and mentors. Yeah, I think that's a great question. The first thing I learned about mentorship is don't go and ask someone, will you be my mentor? People get overwhelmed. And the first thing they'll think is, oh my God, you know, how much time do I have to commit to this person? So don't go and ask people, will you be my mentor? Instead, can you just say, hey, can I have coffee with you? Uh, can I buy you a coffee? Can I get some career advice from you? At least that is something that has worked you know, for me. Uh, one of my mentors, Gohar Rizvi, uh, he was a professor at Harvard. I, I, I emailed him for two years and got no response, but I kept at it. So don't give up. You know, uh, people are busy. If people don't reply to your emails, don't take it personally. So that's one. Then uh, stick to it. And then start with small conversations and saying, can I have coffee with you once in three months? Can I just meet you for half an hour to talk about some of these ideas? And then the other strategy is, is to recruit mentors for a year. Then you can say, listen, I'm at this stage of my career. Uh, will you be willing to give me, uh, you know, four hours or three hours of your time in the next one year, you know, 30 minute slots. Uh, you know, we can get on a call every three months. And this is what I want to achieve. Can you help me think through this? I think mentors are absolutely essential for any, any person's growth and development. And try to find mentors in your own field or, you know, your aspiration should define who your mentor should be. If you want to be a politician, then find a political person. If you want to be an entrepreneur, find someone who has built something, right? If you want to be an academic, find someone who is in that career. Start with that. And then your interests will change and your mentors will also change. Mentorship doesn't mean that you have the same mentor for 20 years. Mentors can also change and you can have a network of, of mentors. But as I said before, life is too short to make all the mistakes yourself. You need to learn from the mistakes of others. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great answer. Um, I, I know that some universities offer um, programs at the end of the scholarship as well. I, I know we do in St. Andrews in any case. Um, so, so you'll have a chance to learn a little bit more about about the opportunities afforded to you then. Uh, uh, Preksa, are you there? Did you want to unmute yourself? Hello. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm currently working on a way to encourage students to engage with their own career planning and exploration. Um, what in your experience helps motivate people to explore the opportunities available to them? And like along the same lines, why are students so reluctant to see the range of possibilities open to them and instead go for the more obvious career paths? In a COVID-19 environment, I think the best thing for young people is to, is to, is to volunteer. And anyone offering career uh, services, advice to young people, 
the world needs more volunteers. We can make a difference in the lives of others. So many people are in grief, are in pain, uh, in developed countries, in developing countries. Mental health is a big issue. And the reason volunteerism is a great way of engaging young people right now, because the job opportunities are limited. Look at all the top companies around the world. Who's hiring? You know, there's so much economic uncertainty. So I think the professional aspirations of most young people will need to be deferred by six months to a year. Does it mean that we just stay at home and do nothing? Can we find ways of engaging young people in this time that they can build some skills, you add some value. And in the bigger scheme of things, if your career is on pause for a year, it's not going to have a huge impact. So, so encouraging volunteerism, en encouraging young people to give back to society through you know, teaching, mentoring, whatever form that is, I think is a great way of, uh, of making use of this particular time. Um, and it will also help the mental health of uh, young people who will engage in volunteerism. Thank you very much. Do we have anybody else who would like to ask the, the final question? Yes, hello. Oh. Yes. Hi. Yeah, um, actually, I've been recently inspired to make a social change um, by forming a student's organization. But it seems like I'm alone, with, like I'm alone without any people, or I can't find someone who is having a like mind with me. So, like, I would like to see how you did when you first got your inspiration of thought of um, having the leadership education in Bangladesh and also um, which um, or which skill would you recommend me to like polish to get this um, networking back so that I could form um, a group and find some like-minded people. Yeah, thank you. What skill would I recommend for starting something, starting a project? Alex, I, would you? Yes, and find some people so that we could form a group or team to work on. Yeah, the so first step would be, right. yeah. yeah. So, you know, the first step would be just talking to people. The more people you talk to, unless you talk to people, you're not, you'll never find out who's, who thinks like you. So I think a good starting point would be to interacting uh, with people. And the more people you talk to, you can figure out who thinks like you, um, where you can find people with common interests. I think uh, uh, that would be, that would be uh, useful. So I would say, you know, communication skill is, is important, particularly in working with other people in a team. Um, the other thing that I've realized over the years is uh, an underrated quality for leadership is emotional maturity or emotional intelligence. You know, the, the ability to quickly figure people out, to connect to people, to build a rapport with people. I think these are uh, useful skills uh, when you're working in a team, when you're trying to put together a team. But the good thing for you is you can just Google emotional intelligence. There are like lots of articles on Harvard Business Review that you can download, you can read. And, uh, and this is a skill that can be developed. So that's the good thing. Uh, so I would encourage you to, you know, do a bit more reading on emotional intelligence uh, and communication skills uh, when it comes to working in a team or putting a team together. And attend your later leadership sessions because I know that there is a lot of uh, work towards emotional intelligence in those as well. That's a good shout. Does that answer your question? Oh, yes, yeah, sure. Thank you. In which case, uh, let me again say thank you very much, uh, EJ, for, uh, for, for, your, for your time today. Um, 
Susanna Kemp also wrote a huge thanks. Uh, and uh, yeah, just a big thank you from everyone. And, and also thank you to all the scholars who've contributed the questions um, and, and comments. And, uh, and hopefully this is kind of the start of a conversation. This is not just a, not just a come here, listen, and then leave again, but use it and think, uh, as we said, we're recording the session so you can go back and listen. Um, and, and I know from experience that EJ is always fantastic about uh, about being around and helpful and, and also your the other people who are doing laid law with you will also be very happy and, and always there to kind of help and support you. Um, so yeah, thanks EJ. Um, I look Absolutely, forward to thank you so much. Thank you, uh, thank you Alex for having me. Thank you to all the laid law scholars for uh, spending time. It was uh, wonderful engaging with you. And uh, for those of you who want to pursue entrepreneurial opportunities, if you need to have a further chat, I'm I'm happy to uh, happy to happy to contribute. I'll uh, share my email and the presentation. I'm also going to uh, share with Alex, and uh, happy to happy to serve as a resource. And I wish you all the best. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thanks, AJ. You too, and all the best to your Thank family. Thank you. Take care.